Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from Creation Today, which is a bit of a mess, so I'll probably be jumping around a bit. It's mostly about Noah's Flood, and whether that flood was local or global, but it's interspersed with ads for their other products and interviews with other people and whatnot, not to mention Eric's sidekick who is trying really hard to be good at bad jokes, but it doesn't end up working. Dude makes Bodie Hodge look like a comedic genius. So let's go! Get your pen, get your paper out right now because we're going to take a quiz. We want to see what you know about what the Word of God says about Noah's Ark and the Flood. Here we go, Eric. Ooh, Bible quiz time. Okay, I'm game. I will write all my answers down before I look them up. Pen and paper quiz ready. You've got the first question, Yes, Eric. question number one. How many days did the flood last? What do people say, Ben? Yeah, this is one that I see in my comment section fairly regularly whenever I mention that the flood was supposedly about a year long. Most people think immediately of the 40 days and 40 nights, but that was just how long it rained for. The earth was supposed to have been flooded for about a year. I mean, the exact amount of time varies depending on which verse you're reading. The flood story is one of those instances where a later editor put two stories together, but it's not as neat and tidy as the two creation accounts in Genesis. It's almost like the verses alternate which story they're telling. But either one, when you tally up the number of days, it was roughly a year. And most people are going to say 40 days and 40 nights, but... The correct answer is more than 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible says it rained on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Then for 150 days, the waters prevailed upon the earth. You can read this in Genesis chapter 7 and Genesis chapter 8. And then after that, the water began to assuage, literally kind of like a sloshing back and forth as the ocean basin sank down and the mountains rose up, according to Psalms. So when you take the total time from beginning to end, Flood lasted about a year. Yay, I got one right. About one year. We just said a swage. It's a good old King James word. We're ben. moving on to the next question. <laughs> there is nothing special about the word assuage. I mean, it's not the most common word, but I read it in novels as a child before I ever saw it in the Bible. Now, that probably had something to do with the denomination that I grew up in favoring the NIV version over the King James, but still, it's not really that special of a word. How many of each animal assuaged? No. How many of each animal were on the ark, Eric? Now, this one is harder than question one because it is a direct and explicit contradiction. In one verse, it specifically says two of every animal, and in another verse, it explicitly states seven of the clean animals and birds. Now, like I promised, I wrote that before looking it up, so let's go look at what it actually says. So, Genesis 7-2 explicitly states to take seven pairs of all clean animals, male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, the male and female. So, I was off slightly. It's seven pairs, not seven individuals, and that actually makes more sense because, you know, the whole mating thing. But then we go to verse 8, and it says, Of clean animals, and of animals that are not clean, and of birds, and everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah. Now that's not as explicit a contradiction as I seem to recall. It's just saying they walked side by side. There could have been seven pairs going two by two, right? Yeah, but um, here we go. We need to just turn the page backwards a little bit. Go to chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It says, And of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark and keep alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. So here we have it explicitly stating that two of everything will be on the ark, clean and unclean, birds and creepy crawlies. My guess here is that Eric is going to try and harmonize these accounts by completely ignoring the part where it says two of everything and specifies birds and whatnot in that, and uh, just going with the seven pairs of clean animals and birds and two of everything else. Most people are going to say, I got the answer, it's two, two of each animal. And you would be close, but you would be wrong because clean animals, according to Genesis 7-2, were by the sevens. It says, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. Verse 3 says, of fowls also of the air. Yep, there we go. Even though it explicitly states in chapter 6 that it's two of every clean animal and birds, somehow the seven that comes later overrides that in a non-contradictory way? 
Okay, question number three. Hope you're doing okay on your quiz here. How big was the ark and what did it look like? What's your answer, Ben? What do people say? Okay, offhand, I don't remember how many cubits the ark was supposed to be in each direction, but I do know that it was supposed to have three decks, one small window, and one door. And I remember the door gets sealed up after Noah and his family get on board. So there are now thousands of animals at a minimum, according to creationist numbers, but really it would have had to have been millions in order to avoid hyper macro evolution right after the flood, all sharing one tiny window for ventilation. Now, if you go to the U.S. National Library of Medicine's page on methane, it lists farmers as being people who are at risk of methane exposure. Farmers, people who spend a good chunk of their time outdoors in good ventilation. But the methane can sometimes build up to dangerous levels on their farms. Now take their farm, increase its animal population density by an order of magnitude or two, and plunk them all in a boat that is significantly smaller than the Titanic was, and give them one tiny window for ventilation, and they're all dead. Death by mass fart. Not the most pleasant way to go. But what did it look like? Probably not like this picture. <laughs> I know. With animals hanging out on the side and everything. The giraffe's neck sticking up out the top of the ark. Actually, that picture brings up a good question. There are a lot of critters out there that cause problems for people because they damage our wood construction, like woodpeckers and termites. Now, sure, he'd only have to bring two of each, but a queen termite can lay several thousand eggs per day. One year is plenty of time for them to wreak some serious havoc, along with the carpenter ants, wood wasps, bark beetles, moths. But of course, these guys are all part of a larger kind of animal, aren't they? Ants and wasps, after all, are very closely related, so Noah would have only needed one wasp kind on the ark that then evolved faster than anything any evolutionist is claiming to produce the hundreds of thousands of species of wasp, plus the 12,000 ants and 16,000 bee species that we have today. Now, assuming just 200,000 species of wasps, that's 57 new distinct species every year since the time of the flood. Why don't we see this kind of rapid speciation now? And most creationist organizations, Creation Today included, like to say that there was an ice age immediately after the flood that lasted for a couple hundred years. Well, wasps and whatnot generally don't like the cold, so there's several hundred years where they wouldn't have been able to diversify at that rate, so it would have had to have been a lot faster than that. Yeah. Mm, it's cute, yeah, it's but, cute. It, but inaccurate. Very inaccurate. Actually, the Bible tells us the dimensions of the ark. You can look that up, but it's 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits. In other words, to the people of the time, a great ship of impossible proportions that had never been built before. But to modern people, a boat much smaller than a cruise ship, but too big to be made completely out of wood because we've tried that before. Now, I went on a cruise a few years ago aboard the Regal Princess, a ship that is 330 meters long and 66 meters high, with 19 decks. Here's a picture to compare their sizes. This is to scale, both for length and height. The Regal could carry 3,500 passengers and 1,300 crew. Let's round that up to 5,000 people. And the vast majority of these people had to be stuffed into tiny cabins in order to fit them all. And there was a modern ventilation system keeping everyone supplied with fresh air, and it often felt too crowded for my taste. So considering the fact that people are animals, you've got three times the animals on a ship that's roughly 10% of the size, with only one single window for ventilation. Now, even if I give you the benefit of the doubt and say the window went the whole length of the arc, that still wouldn't be enough. Now, maybe it would be enough to vent the methane from the animals. Doubtful, but I'm not doing the math on that. But even if it did vent all of the methane, carbon dioxide is heavier than air. In other words, the methane might make its way out the top by virtue of the fact that it's lighter than air, but the carbon dioxide would collect in the belly of the arc and suffocate everything on it. But when you use the 18-inch cubit, that would be a 450 foot long by 50, uh, 75 feet wide by 45 feet tall arc. Well, I used answers in Genesis measurements, which used a longer length cubit to come up with 510 feet long and 50 feet high. So Eric's arc is smaller than the one that I used, so his is even more ridiculous. And it would have had three layers in it, plenty of room for Noah, the animals, and the food supply for that year-long voyage. No, there definitely would not have been enough room for food, fresh water, and all the animals, given the typical creation of super low estimate of 16,000 individual animals. Okay, now wait a second. I remember reading 16,000 on an AIG website, and while looking for it so I could use it as a source, 
I found their Ark Encounter website, of course, where they say that the worst case scenario calculation has Noah caring for 7,000 individual animals, meaning he had about 3,500 species on board the Ark. So, yeah, he still doesn't really have room for all the food and fresh water and animals themselves and whatnot, but that becomes less of a concern now that we have a much smaller number for the evolution to start happening. You see, there are an estimated 7.7 .7 million species of animal, with about 25% of those being marine animals, so about 5,775,000 species of land animal. Subtract the 3,500 species that Noah started with, and we have 5,771,500 species that need to evolve from these 3,500 original species in just 4,000 years. So speciation needs to happen at a rate of 1,442 new species every year, or just under four new species every day to get from the initial 3,500 to the biodiversity that we have today. Oh, but it gets even worse than that, because AIG and Creation Today are both under the impression that dinosaurs were on the Ark. So not only do we have to account for the millions of species around today, but at least some of the billions of species that have existed and went extinct. This is one of several Catch-22s of Noah's Ark. You either have way too many animals on the Ark for eight people to adequately care for, never mind the ventilation and food supply, or you have massive amounts of evolution at rates that would make Stephen Jay Gould look like a gradualist. Oh yeah, and uh, even with these lower numbers, it's still way too many animals for eight people to adequately care for. For the next question we may go down under, oh. we want to know where did kangaroos come from, Eric? Oh. Well, I'm curious as to why that would be part of a Bible quiz, because the Bible doesn't actually say. It doesn't even hint at the existence of kangaroos. But from what we know of the development of marsupials, kangaroos would have come from a lineage of marsupials that started in Laurasia, where China is now, migrated west toward what is now the western United States, moved down south to South America, and then across to Australia, during the period when these continents would have been connected as the supercontinent Gondwana. That's what the fossil evidence shows at any rate. That's actually a more detailed answer than you probably are interested in. Modern kangaroos originate in Australia. There has never been any evidence of a kangaroo existing outside of Australia without humans having brought them there, like in zoos and whatnot. Not under the desk. I, I know what most people think, uh, and write down your answer real quick, but most people are going to, and you can say it right now, out loud in front of your computer or TV, Australia. Australia. Australia, mate. But that would be incorrect. Definitely incorrect. We know that all the animals came after creation. They came from God, but then later they came from the Middle East in the ark and they spread to the rest of the world according to the Bible. They just did so without ever leaving a single trace of their existence anywhere outside of Australia. How quickly did these kangaroos get to Australia anyway? Conservatively, there's about 10,000 kilometers from Mount Ararat to Australia, and that's if we're going in a straight line and ignoring the topographical features. You know, like the Himalayan mountains that they would have had to get past? This is post-flood. Mount Everest and the Himalayans exist now, in the creationist view. So the two kangaroos just hopped directly toward Australia without stopping anywhere? One big migration for this non-migratory species? Oh, but the males have been known to travel long distances in search for mates. But the male from the Ark already has a mate, and the females don't do a lot of traveling. So what caused these kangaroos to travel such vast distances over geographical hurdles that give fully equipped humans significant trouble still to this day? But kangaroos look downright reasonable compared to the sloths. It's about 11,000 kilometers from Mount Ararat to South America, and sloths have a top speed that is a lightning-fast 1.9 kilometers per hour meaning it would take a sloth 5,789 hours to make the journey if it traveled at top speed in a straight line without stopping to eat, sleep, or take the enormous dumps that they are famous for. That's 241 days straight of just walking towards South America. But sloths don't like to move, hence their names. And yet they went on a determined journey across thousands of kilometers of all terrains, including ocean, to get back to their homeland, all without any of them deciding to settle down anywhere else. Here's the thing. We can use biogeography to trace the movement of plate tectonics. By tracing the range of extinct land animals, we can see where the continents must once have been connected. You would expect, if the story of Noah's Ark were true, that the study of biogeography would instead tell us a story of species radiating out from the Middle East, but it doesn't even come close to that. Question number five, was it really a worldwide flood? Well, it no, it was not. As long as humans have existed, there has not been a period where the entire planet was covered with water with no land showing. 
Even within the Bible, it is unlikely, even though it does describe it that way. After all, where did the olive leaf that the dove brought back to Noah come from? Plants are one of the aspects of the flood that creationists largely ignore. Nowhere in the story does it mention Noah having to save the plants. It does mention that he brought every kind of food on board, so you might take that as him saving all the food crops, but just plants in general would have had no way of surviving. Yet somehow, when the flood starts receding, the way that Noah can tell if the land is starting to dry up is that his bird brought back an olive leaf from an olive tree. So this olive tree was alive and producing leaves immediately after being submerged in salt water for at least a year. Where did this tree come from? How did it survive? How did the plant species that are specific to certain regions survive, like the cacao tree that is found nowhere outside of Central America? And let's just forget about plants for a moment. How did the cultures that lasted through the period of the flood survive? Egypt seems to have gone right on through their sixth dynasty without having noticed a disruption. At least three Chinese Neolithic cultures continued on also without interruption. The Norte Chico civilization of Peru doesn't seem to have been bothered by any massive flood. And there are more. So we have plant life that couldn't have survived but somehow did, and several civilizations that should have been wiped out but had the audacity to not even notice the worldwide flood. So I know according to you guys the answer is yes, it was worldwide, but you have to ignore a lot of data to reach that conclusion. You know, I got to tell you, it seems really clear to me, Ben, that this was a global flood if it says all the high hills were covered, but let's just erode any idea of a local flood. Erode, I see what you yeah, did there. You caught it. Okay, so it good. says all the high hills were covered, so all the hills are covered, and then the highest mountain covered by 15 cubits. Well, we have an animation here. <laughs> no, you don't. You have a picture. Animations generally move. It kind of shows the property of water. Yes. If water is above something, it goes and fills every inch. So it would have been impossible for the highest mountain on Earth to be covered and not the whole Earth to be covered. Thank you. Okay, that's nice. But you already have to believe a bunch of impossible stuff in order to accept a worldwide flood. Why is this one more thing a problem? God is powerful enough to keep olive trees alive underwater for a year and to repopulate the earth with just two of every animal without leaving any genetic trace of a bottleneck, all while producing a geologic record that makes the earth look billions of years old, but God covering a mountain with 15 cubits of water without the water spilling over the other side of the mountain is somehow too much for you? At least with the local flood interpretations, you can make some of the story line up with the data. I mean, there's still plenty of problems, but hey, it is possible that we've actually found evidence of the local flood that the stories of Noah and Gilgamesh were based on. So you could use that to support your story. But no, you have to claim that all geologists except for the four or five that work for creationist organizations are wrong about almost everything in their field of expertise. People that think that believe in this local flood idea, they would have to account for this. Just like you would have to account for the survival of plants, and how sloths got to South America, and how kangaroos got to Australia, and how several cultures survived right through the time of the flood without interruption, and, and, and. It is much easier to either agree that covering the tops of the mountains was an exaggeration for effect, or to say that God magically held back the waters, than to deny the dozens to hundreds of facts that run counter to the idea of a truly global flood. It, it just simply doesn't make sense. Here's what I was thinking. If God gave Noah 120 years to build the boat, why didn't he just tell Noah to move instead? Why is it called Noah's Ark instead of Noah's cart. So creationists are allowed to make hypothetical suggestions that would have been a better plan than what God actually did when it supports their narrative. But when I point out flaws in how God supposedly did stuff, that's when God is working in mysterious ways and he had reasons for doing it that way that are beyond human understanding. How dare you question God? Maybe God had a good reason for Noah not to move that we mere mortals just can't comprehend. How dare you question God's great and perfect plan? Eric, as we move on, let's keep reading. Verse 21. All the flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and the beast and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. What about the plants, though? How did they survive? I really want to learn your answer to that. How did a mature olive tree live underwater for a year? 
How did entire civilizations survive through the flood without seeming to notice it if they were all killed? So all animals, every man who was breathing, everything. So unless there's people that weren't breathing that were alive, the undead (laughs) zombies, everyone else died. Everybody's dead on that. There are no zombies. I mean, according to the Bible, there was at least one zombie event in Jerusalem just after Jesus died. So zombies are well within the realm of possibility, according to the Bible. But perhaps this was just another exaggeration for effect. You know, like how at the beginning of the story it says that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually? That cannot possibly be literally true. The most evil, despicable person to have ever existed must have, at some point, thought things like, I wonder what I'll have for lunch, or I think I'll go to bed now. So that is clearly an exaggeration. Why could the other absolute statements in the story not also be exaggeration? Okay. Eric, here's the question. Thanks for clarifying. (laughs) Here's the question. If the water did not cover the earth, then I think it is a greater miracle that God drowned and exterminated people whom and animals whom the water never reached. It's kind (laughs) of hard to drown in water that never gets to you. This was a global flood. Can you please just take a moment to listen to what you are saying with a tiny bit of self-awareness? You literally just said that the extermination of every person on the face of the earth is a miracle, a great miracle, something good that God did. Mass genocide. Sure, the story says they're all evil, but genocide is never the moral solution to any problem. It's actually a science fiction trope that the good guys always seem to have trouble because they refuse to do the wrong thing, with the wrong thing being the extermination of entire races. Because we saved the universe, but at a cost. And the cost is him. He destroyed the Daleks. He committed genocide. He's too dangerous to be left on his own. And yet, there's God, the ultimate good guy, according to you. God, who decided that the best thing to do was to exterminate not just one race, but every race of any animal that was on the face of the planet, except for one representative mating pair. Now, he could have done it quickly and painlessly, but no, a year-long flood with everything dying by drowning is the optimal way to go. That would be a greater miracle. You know, that brings up the the whole idea of God's promise as well. God promised uh, Noah he would never again destroy the world with a flood, and the promise was? The promise of the rainbow. The rainbow. Which I think the promise of the rainbow should be promise that all of us get Skittles for working so hard on the Creation Today show. The promise of the rainbow. You know, that thing that God has to put in the sky to remind himself that he promised not to kill us all with a flood again? God is forgetful. It says so in the Bible. If we have to take this whole thing literally at face value, it literally says, when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Why would he need a sign to remember the covenant? It's not for people to remember. It explicitly states that it is God who does the remembering when the bow is in the sky. Just like every single thought of every single person was wicked. Just like every mountain was covered with 15 cubits of water. Just like every living thing that breathes was killed. This is another creationist catch-22. If you insist on a literal, plain reading interpretation of the story, there are parts that make God look fallible, such as his regret at making humans, and his needing a reminder not to kill them all again. But as soon as you introduce exaggeration, literary devices, metaphor, allegory, glitches in translation, or anything like that to explain these aspects away, then those same devices become available to use on the rest of the story for alternate interpretations. So God being able to experience regret or needing a reminder is a literary device of some kind or a translation error of some kind. Why then must all the high hills and mountains being covered be literal and not another literary device or translation error? Same thing can be said of the creation myth, which I went through last week with the CMI Creation Station guys. Clearly the Bible is claiming that this was a universal flood. The question is, do we want to believe what the Bible says? Clearly the Bible is claiming that God is imperfect and is capable of making mistakes and having regrets and needing reminders. The question is, do we want to believe what the Bible says? Is God an evil being for judging the world? Not for judging the world, but for making the sentence disproportionate to the crime. 
Any time in history when one group of people has attempted to entirely eliminate another group of people, we have looked unfavorably on the people doing the eliminating. Yet somehow, God gets a pass for this in a lot of people's minds. Because, you know, he's God. He knows that the baby that he killed would grow up to be evil, so he was right to kill it. Except God is also supposedly personally involved in the formation of every baby in its mother's womb, so he could have just chosen not to form the evil ones, but no, he thought it was better to make a person that he knew would be evil, let that person live for a few hours, days, months, or years, depending on the case, and then kill that person by drowning before sending them to an eternal torture chamber for the crime of having existed as God made them. Consider this. Number one. We get angry at God and blame him when people commit evil acts. I don't. I tend to direct my anger at the people committing the acts. I don't actually believe that God exists, so there's really no point in raising my blood pressure getting mad at something I don't think is real. Then, when God judges evil acts, we get mad at him and blame him for his judgments. Wrong again. I hypothetically grant certain premises in order to critically examine the stories of the Bible, one of these hypotheticals being the existence of God. I then examine the story through the lens of these premises and find God's actions to often be immoral by almost anyone's standards. But I observe that a lot of people either don't think about God's immoral actions, or they find ways of giving God a pass for actions that we deem reprehensible when they are done by anyone else. I find this attitude to be an excellent example of motivated reasoning, and then go about my life as if nothing has changed, because it isn't. This is an I hate God no matter what kind of attitude. I don't hate God. I just don't think that God exists. And were you to successfully convince me of his existing, you would have a lot more convincing to do to get me to think he was the good guy in the story. Second thing you need to consider. Is it evil for a judge to punish someone? It can be, yes. I am against the death penalty, so when a judge sentences someone to death, I consider that an evil. When judges found people guilty of harboring escaped slaves and sentenced them to be fined or jailed, I consider that to have been evil. When they tortured and executed the escaped slaves, I consider that to have been an evil. Being a judge does not automatically make your sentencing morally good. No, it's actually evil if a judge doesn't punish the guilty party. And there you have it, folks. Eric Hovind thinks that judges in slave-free states should have done a better job at enforcing the punishments for white people that helped escape slaves. It was their moral duty. Lastly, consider this. Everything God does is just. What a cop-out. Of course God did the right thing. Everything he does is the right thing. No need to use your thinky bits to figure it out. Just accept that it was the right thing. Sure, if any human were to behave the way God did, we would condemn them as evil genocidal maniacs, but when God does it, it is justice. <laughs> so, if you say God's decision to judge the world is unjust, well then by what manner or what standard do you call it unjust? Well, let's see now, we could use my standard, we could use the standard of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, uh, there's the standard of the society that I live in, there, hell, even God's own standards in some select parts of the Bible. Pick a standard, God's a criminal, even by his own standard. You're actually using the Bible, using God's standards, to judge God. That was one of the ones that I mentioned, yes. So, if God is found to be evil when judged by his own standards, then you, as a person who holds those standards to be the ultimate authority, must surely agree that God is evil, no? For our interview today, we have John and Mary Ann from the Creation Encounters group. Okay, no further details necessary, I guess. I'm skipping the interview, it's just a promotional interview for the video that these guys made, so it's not really relevant here. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, when you look at just one of these uh, these soda cans, you wouldn't think this is actually 44 grams yeah, of sugar. it's a lot. Got it written on the top there. Um, but that's a lot. You would think, wow, it's not that much. And, you know, I think the same of atheism, the atheistic mm. worldview, is when we look at it from the outside, we go, surely that's not that damaging. But the problem is, is atheism says, no God. Atheism says, well, we're just animals. Yep. And when you think there is no God that you'll answer to one day, and that you are an animal, you'll start behaving like one. Well, I don't think there is a God, and whether or not there is a God, human beings are animals. And as to whether or not behaving like an animal is a bad thing, that depends very much on which animal we're looking at. 
No, I do not want to be killed right after mating like a praying mantis. But I would be okay with helping out a friend in need like rats have been known to do. And then there's the fact that humans have brains that have developed differently from most of the other animals, which have allowed us to gain cognitive functions that aren't possible for the other animals. So we are able to think about our actions and their consequences in ways that no other animal can. We are still animals, we just have the most developed thinky bits of the animal kingdom. And so we often behave differently than the other animals would in the same situation. In other words, there is a lot of nuance in the position. To just say atheism says there's no god, therefore we're just animals, therefore we should just behave like animals, is disingenuous on a number of different levels. You have questions? We have an attempt at an answer. <laughs> I thought the whole thing with creationism is that not having an answer is a bad thing. You know, that whole irreducible complexity thing, where if you don't know exactly how something evolved, it must have been specially created? Or how if we don't know exactly how abiogenesis happened, it must have been creation? Or how if we don't know exactly what happened before the Big Bang, it must have been creation? Most creationist arguments go in one of two directions. Either it ends up being a quote mine, where they get real things that real scientists have said, remove the context, and then claim they were talking about something that they weren't, or it ends up being an argument from ignorance, where we don't know the details of some aspect of evolution, abiogenesis, cosmology, or something else, therefore God did it 6,000 years ago. So your admission here that you are just attempting answers is, by applying the usual creationist thought process, an admission that you are wrong. But I'm more honest than that. I am fine with I don't know being the answer. My objection comes with the therefore God that usually comes next. We yes. got a social media question from Tiberius who says, even if there was a worldwide flood, how does that prove God exists, Eric? Great question. Answer is, it doesn't. Very good, Eric. You got it right. There it we go. It doesn't prove God exists at all. There now, you go, Tiberius. <laughs> but here's what it does. It actually confirms what God's word has told us. When we look around and see evidence of the worldwide flood. Correction. When we look around and see evidence that there was no worldwide flood. There isn't just no evidence of the flood. There is evidence that it never happened. And this evidence can be found in several areas of study. Geology, dendrochronology, meteorology, paleoclimatology, paleontology, and more. R. and Ra's eight video series on the various different sciences that provide evidence against the flood barely even scratches the surface. And we see that the Bible talks about a worldwide flood. We go, science and the Bible match. They agree. No, you're backwards again. Science has evidence that no flood, anything close to what the Bible describes, actually happened. The Bible, though, says that it did actually happen. So therefore, they do not match. And you would expect that if God were real, he would make his book match up with science. Ergo, if a God exists, it is not the God of the Bible. Okay, Eric, there's some people out there that say, if there's evidence out there that contradicts the Bible, then all believe the Bible above the evidence. Yeah, there are. If somewhere within the Bible, I were to find a passage that said two plus two equals five, I wouldn't question what I'm reading in the Bible. I would believe it, accept it as true, and then do my best to work it out and to understand it. Here's the problem with saying that. There isn't any evidence that be. contradicts the Bible because the Bible is true. If science actually supported the Bible, then young earth creationist apologists would be out of a job, because then there would be no need to twist and misrepresent the science to make it fit. The fact that you can make a living doing what you do is a demonstration that the Bible and science do not match up like you're claiming. So it's not evidence, it's something else. There are two ways to look at the world geologically. One, we can say, it, well, first of all, all scientists agree that at some point, the earth was covered in water because we see sedimentary layers. Now, we could say that that was little amounts of water over millions and millions and millions of years. But then the earth has to be really old. Or we can say that a single global flood covered the earth all at one time, and that is why we have the unique features that we do all over the world. See? This is a prime example of a misrepresentation of the science. Yes, most depositional environments are related to water in one way or another, but there are dozens of different depositional environments, only a couple of which are associated with flooding. 
So, no, we do not agree that the entire Earth was covered with water at one point because there were layers. You guys look at all the layers and all the different environments that would have formed them and declare them all to have been formed in one single event, something that is not possible. A global flood would not explain the evaporite deposits. A global flood would not explain the alluvial fans where a body of water ran into a dry basin. A global flood would not explain the tillite deposits laid down by glaciers. A global flood would not explain the aeolian deposits laid down by wind. Yet you see all of these layers and more mixed in together throughout the strata and declare them all to have been the result of one single flood event in direct contradiction to all of the evidence. And then you just sit here saying there's no need to believe the Bible over science because science supports your interpretation of the Bible. Yeah, we gave a top 10 list there of, you know, how we know the world really was covered by water. And one of the things we didn't even get to mention in the top 10 list that geologists have a huge problem with, with the whole way to interpret it, is the geologic column. Is this where you say the geologic column doesn't exist? Because I did go over this in a previous video myself. The geologic column doesn't really exist because geologists are concerned with labeling stratigraphic columns on the geologic time scale rather than constructing some universal column that wouldn't actually be globally applicable because, you know, local environments and all that. Now, there are places where the stratigraphic column is remarkably complete, and they might be referred to as the geologic column, but even here, very few layers are universal throughout the entire planet, and in these places there is abundant evidence of slow formations. Hell, some 46% of geologic strata in existence are made up of shale. Shale can only form in calm water, so 46% of the strata of the planet could not have been formed in a massively destructive flood, and they are interspersed amongst the other layers, so it's not like all the shales on the bottom, so formed before the flood and then the other layers formed during the flood, or that the shale is all at the top, leaving the older layers to have been formed in the flood. So even if I grant you your point that the geologic column doesn't exist in any one place, that still doesn't get you away from the fact that geology has abundant evidence against a global flood 4,000 years ago. If you were to combine the geologic column and put it in one place in the world, it would be 100 miles thick. That depends very much on what the layers are made of in that area. Some layers that represent vast periods of time are millimeters thick. Other layers that represent relatively short periods of time can be several meters thick. I would like to see your calculation for that is what I'm saying. There's only one place in the geologic, well, two places that the geologic column actually exists, and that's in the textbooks and in the, uh, in the museums that set it up to try to preach this and use the geologic column to teach millions of years. <sighs> and here I thought for a moment you were going to say North Dakota and Australia, because those are two of the most complete stratigraphic columns found so far, with strata representing every geologic age going back to the Cambrian. So our viewers need to re be reminded that the geologic column doesn't exist in the earth, yeah. it exists in the minds of evolutionists and atheists. I think the word you're looking for there is geologist. But yeah, you need to do your poisoning of the well. Anyone who accepts the stratigraphic column must do so because they want to believe evolution is true so that they can deny God. Except I think you'll find that most geologists are accepting of evolution not because they want to deny God, but because they realize it fits perfectly with the data that they collect and analyze in their study of geology. I have a quote from C.S. Lewis here, if I can find it, it's such right a good there. quote. Right there, oh, here we go. I believe in Christianity, this is what C.S. Lewis said, as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I mm. see everything else. And oh, what a great statement by C.S. Lewis. Absolutely. Oh, you want to bring up C.S. Lewis, do you? Okay, let's see what he had to say about evolution. To the biologist, evolution covers more of the facts than any other hypothesis at the present on the market and is therefore to be accepted unless or until some new supposal can be shown to cover still more facts with even fewer assumptions. It makes no cosmic statements, no metaphysical statements, no eschatological statements. So it seems that C.S. Lewis viewed biological evolution as an adequate explanation for the diversity of life that has no impact whatsoever on his faith. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Liberty Research, who says, You are asking why certain water-bound creatures can only breathe air. You remember the story of Jonah and the big fish? Perhaps the designer needed a reason for the big fish to surface and spit out the food it just couldn't digest. Man, that's a fun one. So for context, this was in response to me stating that the aquatic mammal's possession of lungs rather than gills is a design flaw, because now they can drown in the substance in which they live. 
Think if you had to stick your head underwater every few hours or so because you couldn't breathe air. That's a nuisance, and if you can't get to water in time, you're done for. So, according to this person, God designed an entire category of animals, some 90 species, so that one time, one guy could get swallowed by one, and God couldn't make that creature surface by himself for some reason, so he gave it the need to surface periodically to force the issue. Sure, makes perfect sense. This one gave me a laugh at any rate. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially Mark McManus, who are the electricity that keeps the electromagnet of my channel magnetized. If you'd like to make metal more attracted to me, you can support the channel for as little as $1 per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!